Who is the greatest physicist of all time? There's a good chance you just thought of Isaac Newton or Albert Einstein, and deservedly. Newton is arguably the father of physics and calculus, and Einstein, well, his face is basically synonymous with the word scientist, not to mention relativity and everything else he did. I'd like to propose a slightly more specific question, the one in the title. Who was the greatest American physicist of all time? And by American, I mean born and bred in the United States. I'll ask you to pause this video right here and leave your answer in the comments below. My answer to this question will probably surprise you, and by the title and thumbnail, you know it's not Richard Feynman. But by the end of this video, I think you'll agree with my pick. Because from high school chemistry to vector calculus to thermodynamics, his influence is truly immense, from a conceptual level even down to the notation we use. In fact, by his own admission, this physicist bested Einstein, and yet most people know nothing about him. You've almost certainly heard his name, but probably didn't give it very much thought. And I made this video to change that. On February 11th, 1839, in the city of New Haven, Connecticut, Josiah Willard Gibbs Jr. was born. His father, of the same name, was an American linguist and theologian who served as a professor of sacred literature at Yale. A staunch abolitionist, Gibbs Sr. is most well known for his involvement in the famous Amistad case in which African captives aboard the Spanish slave ship La Amistad mutinied around the coast of Cuba and tried to return to Africa, but were later captured by the U.S. Navy. Gibbs Sr. learned the Mendy language of the African prisoners and served as a crucial witness, eventually helping them to freedom. His son, however, was a meeker child. The fourth of five children and the only boy, Gibbs Jr. took after his mother in looks. His intellectual absorption, along with fragile health, kept him occupied without participating much in student and social life. Young Josiah came from academic royalty. On his father's side, he descended from Samuel Willard, acting Harvard College president for seven years. And on his mother's side, one of his ancestors was Jonathan Dickinson, the first president of Princeton, then called College of New Jersey. An undeniable genius, Gibbs attended Yale at age 15, received numerous prizes in math and Latin, and graduated near the top of his class. At 24, Gibbs received the first ever PhD awarded in engineering in the United States, and the fifth PhD in any discipline. His thesis was, on the form of the teeth of wheels and spur gearing, riveting I know, which applied geometrical analysis to gear design. This tendency to apply mathematical rigor to physical problems would continue, and was greatly ahead of its time, as most US scientists then were more interested in application. It's all the more impressive and sad, because at this point, both of Gibbs's parents had died. Perhaps it was this, along with his own susceptibility to tuberculosis, that kept Gibbs from ever marrying. After serving a three-year tenure at Yale as a tutor, in 1866 Gibbs and his sisters traveled to Europe, living first in Paris and then Berlin. He attended lectures of many great physicists, including Kirchhoff, Helmholtz, and Bunsen, some of the leading minds in the field of thermodynamics. Then, in 1869, Gibbs returned to the United States. His time in Europe had left a great impression on him, such that his scientific mindset had become much more European than American. That is, much more emphasis on mathematical rigor and theory. In 1871, he was appointed Professor of Mathematical Physics at Yale. Though without any significant publications, he went unpaid by the university. Unbothered by this, Gibbs started to produce. His first paper, published in 1873, emphasized phase diagrams. You might have seen these in chemistry. Essentially, they are like graphical representations of various quantities, showing regions of different phases like water vapor, water, and ice. As he didn't have much recognition, the paper was published in a very small journal, and it didn't get many eyes on it in the US. The work was also far too dense for most to comprehend, but it did catch the eye of one James Clerk Maxwell, the godfather of electromagnetic theory, and the bane of many freshman engineering students. Maxwell was so enthused by Gibbs's paper that he hand-molded two plaster casts illustrating Gibbs's concept in three dimensions. He mailed one to Gibbs and it's on display at the Yale Physics Department. Unfortunately, collaboration between the two was relatively short-lived as Maxwell died very soon in 1879. A joke began to circulate about this. Only one man lived who could understand Gibbs's papers. That was Maxwell and now he is dead. Afterwards, Gibbs formulated perhaps his most important work, a 300-page paper, On the Equilibrium of Heterogeneous Substances, which laid the groundwork for the fields of physical chemistry. 
It has been called the Principia of Thermodynamics, giving its status similar to Newton's Principia on calculus. The beginning line is a quotation from Rudolf Clausius. The energy of the world is a constant. The entropy of the world tends towards a maximum. This would later become known as the first and second laws of thermodynamics. The theme of a claim only in posterity permeates Gibbs' life and work, as even at this point, Gibbs remained unpaid at Yale and was only offered wages $2,000 a year in 1880. And this only really happened because the newly established Johns Hopkins University offered Gibbs a $3,000 yearly wage, and Yale had to offer their own pay to keep Gibbs there. Gibbs, though, seems to have been unaffected by this lack of recognition. A kind man, he never married and remained living with his sister Julia and her husband until his death. Gibbs embodied the ideal of the unselfish Christian gentleman. He was not a freak, he was a kindly dignified gentleman. Nor did he exhibit any of the physical mannerisms or eccentricities sometimes thought to be inseparable from genius. However, these surprisingly normal traits did not prevent Gibbs from producing groundbreaking work. In high school or college chemistry, you probably worked with Gibbs free energy which is just a measure of how much usable or free energy there is in a system to do some sort of work. Before Gibbs, Hermann von Helmholtz had derived a very similar quantity, the aptly named Helmholtz free energy. Both of these define some sort of free energy quantity as the total internal energy of a system, minus ST, the unusable energy, more commonly known as heat. Gibbs free energy also adds the term PV to account for any change in final pressure or volume of the system. In this sense, Gibbs free energy is more correct than Helmholtz free energy. However, often the change in pressure and volume is negligible and both can be used relatively interchangeably. In general, chemists tend to use Gibbs free energy because they have systems that change in pressure and volume normally, and physicists tend to use Helmholtz free energy because that's not as common. Now, this term ST represents entropy as times temperature T and Gibbs also introduced the idea of expressing a system's total internal energy, U, as a function of the entropy of a system. He formalized and generalized entropy as a statistical concept, which had been earlier proposed by Boltzmann, defining entropy of an arbitrary ensemble as this expression, which simply sums over all the possible states of a system, and each P sub I represents the probability of that state. And this outfront factor is Boltzmann's constant, which just deals with the SI units. This formula is a pillar and arguably the foundation of the whole field of statistical mechanics, which applies statistics and probability theory to microscopic systems. This formula would later play a crucial role in information theory, referred to as the Shannon entropy, and it's now crucial for artificial intelligence research. Along with these developments, Gibbs introduced the concept of chemical potential of a particular chemical substance and created the crucial Gibbs phase rule, which describes how many variables F that are independently controllable for a system with C components and P phases. This formula, along with many others Gibbs derived, was purely theoretical at the time and it took many years before being experimentally verified. To boil it down, a lot of the ideas of statistical mechanics and thermodynamics were floating around in the late 19th century, formulated by scientists such as Carnot, Clausius, Boltzmann, and Maxwell. What Gibbs did was add several more concepts and then tie them neatly into a beautiful and elegant mathematical framework which agreed with experiment. So beautiful and elegant, in fact, that his tools are still used today, relatively unchanged. He is to statistical mechanics what Maxwell is to electrodynamics and Laplace is to celestial mechanics. As an example of Gibbs' scientific foresight, from 1902 to 1904, Albert Einstein published three papers on statistical mechanics, unaware of Gibbs' prior work. Gibbs' work was so well written, though, that after reading his textbook, Einstein considered the formulations superior to his own, and said that he would not have written his papers had he been aware of Gibbs' work. Einstein also expressed that, had he met Gibbs in his lifetime, he may have put him as the greatest thinker he had ever known, next to Lorentz. Now, honestly, what I've mentioned so far already places Gibbs as one of the greatest physicists of all time. However, his contributions definitely don't stop there. In the days of Gibbs, most physicists relied on the use of quaternions to express physical quantities which had both magnitude and direction. These are essentially the real numbers along with the i, j, and k that we write when expressing vectors in component form. Gibbs advocated for representing these quantities as vectors. That's right, Gibbs invented vectors, along with Oliver Heaviside independently. 
noting that the product of quaternions could be separated into scalar and three-dimensional vector terms. His protege, E. B. Wilson, wrote the heavily influential textbook Vector Analysis in 1901 based on Gibbs's notes, and the techniques explained in it were essential for the mathematics of fields like electrodynamics and fluid mechanics. In it, many familiar ideas are expounded upon, including the foundations of vector calculus, along with the introduction of the dot and cross product, including the modern notation we still use. Eventually, quaternions were all but abandoned in favor of Gibbs's vectorial approach in these fields. And that touches on what I think is the final and perhaps most important reason why I think Josiah Willard Gibbs is the greatest American physicist. It is one of the striking features of the work of Gibbs that his formulations of physical concepts were so felicitously chosen that they have survived 100 years of turbulent development in theoretical physics and mathematics. Arthur S. Whiteman, a mathematical physicist who helped found the axiomatic approach to quantum field theory. Throughout the quantum revolution of the 20th century, almost all ideas in physics turned out to be false, or rather, good approximations, but not quite right once you get down to the quantum level. The ether, continuous energy levels, completely discounted. Even Newton's laws did not come out unscathed. Not the case with Gibbs' statistical mechanics. And of course, his contributions to vector calculus stayed strong as well. They survived almost completely unchanged. Gibbs contributed much else to physical optics, exterior algebras, mathematical economics, etc., all of which I can't really get into in this video. All of his major contributions are wide and far-reaching and have applications in almost every corner of physics. You probably clicked on this video because of Feynman in the thumbnail. And while Feynman and his contemporaries certainly contributed a lot to physics, Feynman himself to quantum electrodynamics along with the undeniable impact of his efforts to popularize and exposit physics to the general public, these are by no means small feats. You could also say the same thing of many other greats, Steven Weinberg, Murray Gell-Mann, Oppenheimer, even John Wheeler, who was a student of Gibbs. However, I feel that Gibbs' work even overshadows these. All that Gibbs produced was and still is foundational, and Gibbs contributed to multiple large fields, even essentially creating fields like physical chemistry. Perhaps it was easier to do so during his lifetime than after, but still, the breadth and depth of his work I think is unparalleled by any other American physicist, and rivals the greatest physicists and scientists of all time. On top of this, Gibbs didn't let any of his work get to his head. He had no interest in fame or fortune, so even in his character, Gibbs represented some of the best science has to offer. Gibbs died on April 28, 1903 in New Haven of an acute intestinal obstruction. In 1912, a bronze tablet portraying him was installed in the Sloan Lab at Yale. Now it's named after him. Despite this, and because of Gibbs' modesty, far too few are aware of him and all that he did. I hope that this video changed that for you.